Well, hello, everybody. We are very fortunate to have a very special guest with us. It's been a long time coming, but we are finally interviewing the awesome Nathan Hubler. Welcome, Nathan. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, we've had so many um, interviews before that Nathan has helped set up for us, but we haven't interviewed him, so we thought it was about time that we did. Oh, well, it's good to be here. It should be a lot of fun. Okay, Tasha, you want to go ahead and read the first question? Okay. Could you tell us a little bit about your recent engagement? Sure. Well, that, that could be a whole podcast, and in fact, it is a whole podcast, or uh, at least a, about a half hour on the Boundless podcast about a month ago. So I won't go into the whole story about uh, how my fiancé and I met, but uh, yeah, I'm getting married May 17th, and I'm not only getting married, but I'm going to become an instant dad, so I'm, I'm pretty excited. Yeah, well, congratulations. I was, I was really surprised and happy for you when I... So they got engaged. So, and I and I also heard the podcast that you and your fiance was on. I I found it really really um interesting. The, the story that how you guys got together was really incredible. And for those of you listening and watching, we'll be um linking to the podcast that you can hear um the whole story um in the description of this video. Who would you say is your biggest inspiration for your writing? Well, I think Marshall had a really good answer for this one time, so if you haven't heard it, then I'll just steal, steal his somewhat, and that is that uh, we certainly like to say with Odyssey that um, God is one of our biggest inspirations, um, and hopefully our biggest inspiration, and the reason that we do the show. At the same time, there are a few episodes that we don't want to blame him for that uh, didn't work out necessarily, so uh, you know, we would give him credit for all the all the good shows we've done and the, the ones that didn't work out so well are certainly not his fault. Um, as far as people, I, I'd say that uh, the two biggest inspirations for me are the rest of the Odyssey team because, you know, you interact with them all the time and you're um, in some ways trying to impress them with what you're writing, trying to uh, please them, and then also our listeners. So uh, I'm thinking a lot about the listeners and the uh, kids who are listening when I'm writing the shows and trying to do things that they'll enjoy and also be uh, inspired by. Okay, that was, that was a good answer. I think Marshall will be happy, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> Has there been any scripts or ideas for scripts that you wrote that were never used? Well, all of us have those. It's just part of the creative process, and I think the first few times that you get those, that you get s some distance on an idea and you get a lot of work into it, and then it doesn't end up getting used, it's kind of frustrating, but then you realize pretty quickly that it's just part of the creative process and everybody has those. Um, there are a lot of those that we've had over the years. The, the one that came to mind... Uh, is uh, Album 50. We had so many different ideas for Album 50, and we had a completely different outline than how it ultimately ended up. There were a lot of elements from that al outline that wound up in the uh, final show, but there were a number of storylines that we had brainstormed that didn't end up part of the album. A big thing that we had in there that we didn't use was we wanted to do a flashback to Odyssey history, and we did one episode that was like the origin of Odyssey, a uh, class reenactment, but there was a whole storyline that we had brainstormed where we flashed back to a different period in Odyssey history where there was actually a Mayor Blaggard, of course you'll recognize that name, and uh, so we were going to tell a whole parallel story of what had happened you know, a few hundred years ago in Odyssey. And then uh, we also had a, a pretty big storyline with the Barclays and Stuart Barclay coming back to town. So uh, that ended up getting cut. And then we had a pretty elaborate storyline, too, with the Rathbones and with uh, Bart opening a bed and breakfast in the back of the Electric Palace. But that ended up getting cut because um, between the time we were brainstorming and the time we recorded, Walker Edmiston, who plays Bart, had passed away. And so we didn't want to rely as heavily on Bart. Um, so th there are a lot of factors that end up um, changing ideas. Um, some of them are that the ideas looked better as an idea than they did as a script. Sometimes it's that an actor is not available and so you can't do a particular storyline. And sometimes it's just that um, it ends up feeling similar to another show that we're working on. That's It's curious how that works because um, 
several of us independently will come up with ideas that end up feeling a lot alike. And that's happened a couple of times in recent years with episode ideas that I've been working on. And then we realize, wait a second, this is very similar to something Marshall's working on. And we can't do two of these. Um, It's not only Marshall, but just different writers will come up with uh, the same kind of ideas almost at the same time. It's a little uncanny how that happens, but it means that one of them probably is going to either go by the wayside or be combined into the new idea. Okay. So what character do you wish that you could bring back to the show? Well, there are certainly a lot of those that we've had because uh, actors have passed away um, with a show that's been going on 26 and a half years now with Odyssey. It's just uh, kind of, it just kind of comes with the territory. Uh, certainly Tom and Bart and now Bernard are characters that I'd love to bring back and write a few more episodes for, but um, we can't do that because the, the actors are gone now. Uh, Edwin Blaggard is one that comes to mind a lot. The actor is still with us, but he's retired, and so he's certainly one of the characters that was the most fun to write for because he was just uh, so over-the-top and flamboyant. So um, he, he's one that I really miss. Um, yeah, speaking about Blackard, I I had this question. Um, in a class reenactment, uh, when Edwin's like, you know, burning all those newspapers or those bad reviews, and he has like this you know really big laugh at the end, was that sort of like you guys' is attempt to sort of get like you know Regis Blacker like his laugh in there again at some some way or is that unintentional it wasn't really intentional um it it ended up i remember when we were hearing that show that uh i think it was um just because of how Earl's voice had changed a little bit, that uh, his Edwin voice was sounding a little closer to his Regis voice, and so the laugh ended up sounding a little bit more like Regis than it normally would, but it it wasn't intentional. It was kind of an unintentional, oh, that's interesting that it worked out that way. (laughs) Yeah, Austin used to scare me when I was little. We'd be listening to one of the Blackard episodes, and when it would come to a place where he knew that Blackard would laugh, he'd turn the volume all the way up and scare me after that. (laughs) Yeah, the the one I remember from when I was a kid was it wasn't anything purposeful, but we were listening to the mysterious stranger, and the first part ends on a pretty terrifying moment where there's this creepy laugh, and then wits hit by a beam falling down in an old house, and it got to the end of the episode, and my brothers and I were listening to it, and uh, the episode ended, and none of us wanted to get up out of bed to turn the tape over and hear part two. It was just too scary. <laughs> yeah, that sounds kind of similar. When I um. I was probably about me eleven or twelve when I when the Novacom saga was airing, and um, my uncle had uh, recorded the Black Veil uh-huh. um, on a tape for me to listen to, and we lived in a two-story house at that time, and I was downstairs. And I think Tasha or my sister Ashley was asleep on the couch, and I was down there listening to the episode. The rest of my family was upstairs, and I was listening to the first part, and it freaked me out so bad. I didn't. I didn't want to get up. I didn't want to stay in the room, too, but I finally made my mind just ran up the stairs. That episode scared me so bad. <laughs> but now it, it's not quite as scary, but it still freaks me out. Yeah. You know, those things tend to fade a bit as you get older, but when you're a kid, there are definitely things that really uh, creep into your nightmares, I think. <laughs> What is one Odyssey episode that you wish you could have written or directed differently? Well, on the writing side, I think all of the episodes have something that I go back and wish that I would have changed. Um, It's just part of uh, being a writer, I think, is that you're always revising, and especially with Odyssey, where uh, you're going through a lot of drafts on shows to make the show better, and so uh, you never really finish. There's always something more you could do with the show, and even at playback, a lot of times I'll be thinking, ah, we could have made that line funnier, or we could have made this part better, and it's just uh, par for the course. When I look back on them, there are a few that I think I wish had been a bit different. Uh, one of them was um, All Star Witness. And I think the show is fine, but there were a few connections in there that I thought would be fun. I like connecting to old Odyssey shows, and there's a connection to the old mayor of Odyssey in there. And by the time we ended up recording it, uh, after we'd fixed what we thought were all the logic problems, it just didn't seem to make that much sense that the mayor of Odyssey, after all these years, had this daughter who was a certain age when he had mentioned his grandchildren years and years ago. It just seemed to be confusing. Um, it's probably still possible, but it just seemed like for 
to make this Odyssey connection to a previous episode, it wasn't worth all the <laughs> logic problems we had to fix to get there. So it ended up being convoluted. Um, and another one that I think of is, uh, it's a show called And That's the Truth, which I actually, I really like the theme of the show. Um, it's um, from the episode Speak, or uh, I'm sorry, it's from the verse uh, Speak the Truth in Love. But um, uh, it ended up that part of the show, Tamika's part of the show, where she was uh, speaking the truth but not in love, um, felt a bit out of character for her, felt younger than she was at that point in her development. And so um, I wish that we had tweaked that somewhat and that I had figured out how to make it so it wasn't quite so childish of her. Um, On the directing front, I can't really think of a specific episode, but when I look back to the early shows and remember them, um, I know that I wasn't very efficient as a director. I I would use a lot more words to say what I meant rather than being more direct. And that's, uh, yes, I guess as a director, you want to be direct and just uh, more simply say what you want uh, from the actors. And so that's something that I've learned through the process of directing and some of those early shows. I think uh, the first one that I directed was The Taming of the Two, and it it ended up being a five-hour session because it just took a longer time for me to realize what I wanted and what I wanted to say to the actors. So if I were directing that same show now, I think I could be a lot more efficient because I've gotten more experienced. Do you think that maybe it was also because you, at that time, you also had written that show that maybe, like, you know, it was a little harder for you to convey what you'd already written, like, to direct that way? Not necessarily. I think um, just uh, you often have something in your mind and it's hard to find the exact words to communicate that to the actors. One thing I've done a lot more of now uh, is preparation for directing and going through the script and finding words that, you know, the the right word to say, I really want this to be more emotional or more um, poignant or, you know, finding the right words that you might need to say to the actors if they're not getting what's in your mind. So that preparation has really helped um, the directing to be uh, faster and just more fluid for me. Do you have any stories to share about finding things to put into the official guide? Well, I'd say that that was a job that I could have done forever. You know, we could have uh, kind of like rewriting the episodes with a guide. There always were more stories out there. There was always more that we could tell about Adventures in Odyssey. And I loved those stories and I loved finding new tidbits. And it, it felt like for a period there, it just seemed like, well, there's no way to finish this because there's so much more to tell. And uh, I'd be on the phone with one of the actors and they'd mention something and I'd think, oh, we've got to get that down in the guide. We've got to write this down. And I think that's partially why the guide got to be so thick is there were so many stories to tell about Odyssey episodes. One of my favorite ones uh, from the second edition of the guide when we revised it in 2012 was when one of the fans, uh, Lizzie, went back and found the true story behind a single vote because it had kind of been lost to history, and we, in fact, thought that a lot of the story wasn't true based on some things that we had found and read, but she had done such extensive research to find the actual true story. Um, So I think that was really interesting to be able to include that in the guide. Yeah, I thought thought that was pretty amazing, too. What has been our response to the Odyssey Adventure Club, and what additions or changes will we be seeing in the future? Well, I think at the beginning, when the Odyssey Adventure Club was first, uh, when the rumors were going around about it, we had a few negative reactions to it just because people weren't quite sure what it was. And it was partially our fault because we were still trying to figure out exactly what it was going to be and how it was going to work and um, what would be included and what the costs were going to be. And so it was a little confusing for uh, fans on what this thing was actually going to be. As far as since it's launched, we've had a really positive response to it, I think. I don't know that I've heard anything negative from the people who are actually in the club and uh, their experience there. It's been uh, really uh, uh, something they've enjoyed sharing with their families, and um, it's. I think we have pretty much uh, world-class website and app for them to use, so I think it's been a really good experience. Um, as far as what we'll be seeing in the future, uh, I know that Brock has plans for at least the first year and into the second year on some surprises that we're going to release. Um, I don't want to say too much except to say that there are some unreleased episodes that are going to be part of the club and are going to be available for listeners there. And uh, also some other series that we've done at Focus um, 
some other series for kids are going to be available in there as well. So um, will we be seeing an Android app for the club, or is it going to be exclusively for like iPads and iPhones? No, we certainly hope to have an Android app. Uh, it's just a matter of capacity, really, is that um, there are, if you look at the statistics for other Focus apps and apps outside of Focus, um, the iOS apps are downloaded and installed far more than the Android apps when you look at the numbers. But that said, we know we have a lot of Android um, users, and so we want to serve them as well. So an, an Android app is definitely on the horizon. We're just not sure exactly when it's going to be. We're not sure how far away that horizon is. How about that? <laughs> okay, that makes more sense. Were Zach Callison's last shows as Matthew Parker in Album 57, or will we be hearing those in the OAC or Album 58? It's the OAC. He's actually in a two-part adventure called Mission Unaccomplished that airs this summer, or I guess releases is the proper term for the OAC. Uh, it releases this summer, and those will be the last shows that we'll hear Zach Callison as Matthew in. So we'll be hearing the new actor for Matthew in Album 58? Yes, we will. Uh, we'll be hearing that starting this fall. Speaking of Album 58, will the episodes in Album 58 continue any present storylines from the OAC, or will it all have completely new stories? Album 58 will continue storylines from 57 and the OAC, um, particularly uh, Connie's mom passing away is going to have an impact on what happens in Album 58, and there are a few things from the OAC that are also going to impact it, but for the most part, it's actually a standalone album. It's a multi-part story, similar to The Green Ring Conspiracy, but... Um, um, yeah, it will mostly stand alone. If you haven't heard those previous shows, it'll still make sense to you. Okay. And our last question is, if you could only listen to one AO episode for the rest of your life, what would it be? <laughs> I guess that could be considered, like, what's your favorite episode, but I thought it was sound a little more original. <laughs> yeah, um, boy, uh, I... I you know, I love a lot of the Odyssey episodes. As far as listening to them, it, does this mean constantly for the rest of my life? <laughs> so I think any episode would get go, get old after a while. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, for many years, I said my favorite episode was Waylaid in the Windy City, and that's still probably one of my favorites. Um, so maybe that would be the only one that I'd listen to. I, I mean, I also think of shows that are nostalgic for reasons other than the episodes themselves like um, the last episode that we recorded with Walker or the last uh, show that we recorded with Dave Madden, which uh, I like the episodes themselves, but then they're also special because that was uh, the last time we were with these friends in the studio. So um, even apart from the content of the episodes, those episodes would be fun to listen to. Uh, now, if they were the only episodes, um, it, it's still probably hard to pick, but uh, I guess if I had to answer that question, I'd still say waylaid. All right. And another question that we got at the last minute um, was from David Hilder from the AO Update, and he heard that the new passages on the books, um, that they won't be having like the epilogues and prologues with um, Jack and Wit in them. Is that true? And if it is, is there a reason why? I can't believe that that's already out there. Actually, no, I think the, the <laughs> books are already out. So it's, uh, yeah, that's the, the answer is it is true that uh, the omnibooks of passages and omnibooks, if anyone doesn't know what that term means, is they combined the first three passages books into one and the second three passages books into another. So they're quite a bit thicker um, and also uh, better value. If you want to get all, all the stories, buying two books for a lower price than you'd have to pay for all six books. And yes, they were uh, adapted without the Odyssey opens and closes. And the reason for that is well, a couple of things. One is that um, the passages audience skews a bit older than Adventures in Odyssey. And if people don't know Adventures in Odyssey, they can still enjoy the stories. They're pretty much standalone because the previous versions of them had Wit and Jack discovering the story in a chapter and then the whole story played out um, on its own. And then you had a chapter at the end where Wit and Jack talked about what they had read in these stories. So they are still standalone stories. And if you're not familiar with Adventures in Odyssey, this might be a gateway in a way to uh, read some of these stories and realize, oh, these actually are inspired by the world of Odyssey. And so you don't have to know Adventures in Odyssey to get into these stories. Okay. 
Yeah, th thanks for clarifying that. Well, we want to thank you, Nathan. It was a pleasure talking to you again. And once again, congratulations on your engagement. Yes, thank you.